فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم So now inshallah ta'ala we're going to be speaking about tariq ilm al-jadal the um, history of ilm al-jadal the history and how it came about The foundations of Ilm al Jadal, Usul Ilm al Jadal, was present from the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created creation. The foundations were already there. It's not something a person can say to you, it started at this particular point. Such as when you see the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the debate of Iblis. When Iblis said, Ana khayru minhu khalaqtani min narin wa khalaqtahu min teen. That I am better than Nabiullah Adam, I am better than him. You created him from fire and you created me from teen. This here is called Jidal, which is Batin, that Iblis here used, and it's Tamweeh al Mubtileen, which we'll speak about inshallah ta'ala. But also the debate of I mean, the dialogue of the angels when they said Kalu Atajalu Fiha May Yufsidu Fiha Wayas Fikudima Wanahanu Sabihu Bihamdika Wanukadisulak. So they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Atajalu Fiha will you place on this earth May Yufsidu Fiha those who are going to bring about corruption. And they're going to bring bloodshed. And we exalt. We exalt you with your praise. And we honor you and glorify you, O oh Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also in the Quran, so this is that time, that time, before we were even created. It was going on. The debate was already there. Something old, something can't be traced to a particular starting point. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told us in the Quran, the dialogue and the debates that took place between prophets and their nations, such as Nabi Allah Nuh, and Hud, and Salih, and Shu'ayb, and Ibrahim, and Lut. All of those prophets, there was between them and their people a type of debates. Um, also, if you look at the Quran, there are discussions of Mushriki Quraysh with the Messenger alayhi salatu wassalam when they came to the issue of affirming, affirming that the creation will be recreated again or we resurrected, sorry, that we will be resurrected again from the dead. Also affirming Allah is the only one who should be worshipped alone. And also affirming that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a Prophet and a Messenger sent from Allah. All of this, if you look at the Quran, you find that they were arguing about it. Now when you, when you look at Asr al-Sahaba, the companions, the companions of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they debated in many different fields. They debated in matters of fiqh. Masail which are Masail fiqhiyah, they debated in it. And they also even debated in Masail which were aqadi, aqidah related matters. For example, if you look at the discussion that took place between Abu Bakr and Umar in the issue of hukum mani'i al zakat, those who refuse to pay the zakat. Abu Huraira narrated. And the hadith is collected by Bukhari and Muslim. لما توفي رسول الله when the messenger died واستخلف أبو بكر بعده and Abu Bakr was placed a leader after وكفر من كفر من العرب and those who became disbelievers from the Arabs became disbelievers. قال عمر لأبي بكر عمر said to Abu Bakr كيف تقاتل الناس how are you going to fight with these people? وقد قال رسول الله when the messenger said so Umar is saying this how are you going to fight with these people? 
When the messenger said, Umirtu an uqatil al nasa, I was commanded to fight with the people. Hatta yaqulu la ilaha illallah. Until they say la ilaha illallah. Faman qalaha. And anyone who says it, faman qala la ilaha illallah. Anyone who says this word, Asama minni ma lahu wa nafsahu. Then his blood is secreted from me, safe. And his wealth, illa bi haqqi wa hisabu ala Allah. And his accountability is upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is going to judge him. It's not my job to judge him. Meaning after that, after he comes with this, it's not my job. Faqali, he said, Abu Bakr, Wallahi, la uqatilanna, by Allah I'm going to fight. Man farraqa bayna salati wa zakat. The one who tries to distinguish between the salah and the zakat. The one who tries to pave a path where he wants to make the zakat different from the prayer. I'm going to fight him for it. And he explained himself. He says, فَإِنَّ الزَّكَاةَ فَوَرَلِي الزَّكَاةَ is حَقُّ الْمَالِ It's the rights of the wealth. وَاللَّهِ بَيْ اللَّهِ لَوْ مَنَعُونِ عِقَالٍ كَانُوا يَأُدُّونَهُ إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهِ if they refuse to give me a عِقَال عِقَال is what you now see the Arabs wear on their head. The black one, eh? That originally comes from that was what they used to use for the tile of the camel. When you wanted to tie the camel, you tie them on a tree. So Cult-wise, just they now put it on their heads. Are you there? So if they refuse to give me that, is that worth anything? It's nothing. They used to give it to the Prophet, and now that I have come Abu Bakr, they refuse to give it to me, I'll fight them for it. I'll fight with them for refusing to give it to me. فَقَالَ عُمَرْ Umar said, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا هُوَ إِلَّا أَنْ رَأَيْتُ It wasn't except when I saw that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala قَدْ شَرَحَ صَدْرَ أَبِي بَكَرَ Allah opened the chest of Abu Bakr for this matter. For fighting them, فَرَفَعْتُ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِ فَعَرَفْتُ sorry فَعَرَفْتُ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِ It became clear to me that it was the truth now. When I saw, when I actually saw what he did, I realized it was the truth. So here you can see a dialogue and a discussion going on between Abu Bakr and Umar. Abu Bakr wanted to do something, Umar came and said no. And he put his point across. You see, that was between the Sahabas amongst themselves. Look at when the Firah, the groups came, the deviated sects. The sects that the Messenger warned us from Ali that are going to emerge and come out. You find a different debating and different debates were taking place. Starting from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. When he debated and he discussed with Al-Khawarij many different things. Fi qadaya muta'addida. Different issues he dealt with them with. And this was a debate which I've previously spoken about. So what you see here in an area of deviated groups whose deviation and their problem is basically Aqeedah related. It was Aqeedah related. Here I have to stop you all, inshaAllah ta'ala, and say to you something very important. And that is, a lot of people push this narrative and this argument, which is Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah are people who don't debate and they don't know what debating is. Okay? And this is incorrect. This is incorrect. The mutakallimin, if you look at uh, people of, and even this contemporary time that we're living, you find people say that Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah are only against debating. They are, they slandered any debate there is. And they are not, they say, innahum laysu ahl al All they do is quote a hadith and ayat. They don't know how to debate their points. That's what they say. And they don't have the ability and the art and the power to dialogue and discuss and argue and bring their points forward. And this is attributed to the Salaf Qadeeban before, not just now. Before. And we say to that speech, وَهَذَا الْكَلَامُ كَلَامُ الْخَاطِئِ That speech is incorrect. لَيْسَ sahih. It's not correct and it's not right. And what shows that that is not correct and it's not true and it's not the case? Many matters. One. <coughs> Many matters show that. The first matter that shows it's not the truth is the Quran that we have with us today. Okay? And the Sunnah. The Sunnah. 
and the tariqah, the path of the companions, all of them has shown us in many different ways. Debates, argumentations, dialogue with, the, with those who oppose the, uh, the, the, the truth. And as you would know, is Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they actually follow those three. They follow the Quran, and they follow the Sunnah, and they follow Sahaba to Rasulullah, the companions of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's the path, the path which they're pleased with. Tariqatul Kitab wa Sunnah wa Salaf al Ummah. And so if this is found in the Quran and the Sunnah, and it is found in the path of the companions, then Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah are the first to accept it, and they are the first to recognize it and acknowledge it. So that it's not right for anyone to come and now say, that they refuse it and that they are against it when it is what? Fundamental verses in the Quran. Fundamental verses. Ayat which Asul Azimah have shown this matter. The second reason why this statement is incorrect is and shows you that it's a lie what this statement it carries. That A'imma to Ahl Sunnah, the leaders of Ahl Sunnah. <coughs> The people in which they follow, the leaders of Ahlul Sunnah, are they are ones who have gone into discussions and dialogues. They debated. They went to different dialogues with different groups and different people. And rather you find it more in Aima to Salaf than you find it in anyone else, to be honest. And anyone who reads the biography of the Aima al Awail, the early generation, you will find it Jaliyan Ladehim clear, crystal clear, no taint or dust on it, that they were debaters, and that they debated. Uh, you all know uh, the very well documented debate, which Imam Ibn Abi Al-Izz Al-Hanafi brings in his Sharah of Aqidat Al-Tahawiyah, Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah, when he debated those who wanted to debate, to debate with him regarding the issue of, the, regarding the issue of Allah's existence subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he debated them, rahimahullah. And also look at the debates of Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, which we'll touch on later, bi'idhni Allah al-Kareem. And Imam Shafi'i, if you look at Kitab al-Umm, and Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, there are debates that you see him debating Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, which is referred to, it was called what? This is, a, this is actually a famous, well-known method in fiqh, which is called الجدل الفقهي في الأصول أما في في كلام المتقدمين ده جدل الفقهي أنا ما مشافعي ودبيتي بحمل حسن الشيباني ما تزفق very well documented also him debated مع مع هؤلاء البدع حفص الفرد for example أنا ما مشافعي دبيت لهم أنا نعجب من ذهم and he proved him that what he's saying and what he believes is misguidance and it's against the methodology of the Messenger alayhi salatu salam. You find that Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, Imam Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah he's called. He debated the mutakallimeen and the mu'tazil of his time. He debated them not only with textual evidences. No. He didn't just debate them with al-adillah al-shari'iyah, kitab wa sunnatan. He even debated with them bil-adillah al-aqliyah. That led to, that leads you to, لِمَا فِي الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ That which is in the Kitab and the Sunnah. So, the Sunnah and the Jama'ah were using rationality and they were using the textual evidence, the Kitab and the, and the Sunnah. <coughs> For example, look at this example. And Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, when they said to him, if you guys are affirming Allah, all of these characteristics, then something is they deducted and they reduced, and they, sorry, they extracted this misunderstanding, which is that what would come from this is If you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of these characteristics, then you're actually affirming one who's old, huh? one who is actually old. Sorry, one who is, who's got characteristics, and then that characteristics you're saying is so much then that means there's more than one God that you're affirming due to the many characteristics that you're giving to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, he said to them, in response to that, 
the thing that we're, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who we're describing is one. The that is one. The characteristics are a lot. The, the, the that meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. And the characteristics are a lot. And he gave an example of the tree. It has a root, it has a branch, it has this, and it has this. But it all, it's all one, it's only one tree. Just like a one person can have so many different characteristics. A person can be tall, he can be black, he can be uh, skinny, he can be this. All of those are just one person I'm describing. Okay, this is what? This is Imam Ahmed rahimahullah trying to prove his argument based on what? Bil adillat al-aqliyat al-mu'addiyati al-mu'addiyati lima fil kitab sunnah He's proving his argument, rationality, in a rational manner, improving it based on the kitab and the sunnah. لذلك, if you go and you read the kitab الرد على الجهمية by Imam Ahmed himself رحمه الله, you'll find many examples of the istidlalat and the munaqashat. The evidences and the arguments that are put forth in which he debated with Ahlul Batil, the, the, the innovated people. ولذلك Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah has a very powerful statement in his kitab Tanbih, Tanbih al-Rajul al-Aqil, page 4. He says, كان أئمة الإسلام he said the Aimma of Islam, the leaders of Islam, such as Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and Ishaq ibn Rahuy, and Ali ibn al Madini, and the likes of these people, they said, and Shafi'i, and Abu Hanifa, كان أئمة الإسلام ممتثلين لأمر الملك العلام, that they were following the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is what? وجادلهم, that command, they were following it. These Imams, these scholars, they were ones who were following the command of Allah. So they would debate the people of desires who were misguided. So that they can bring them back to the correct method, to the correct path. So they can bring them back to the correct path. And he also even said, Shaykh al-Islam rahimahullah, وَأَمَّا جِنْسُ الْمُنَاظَرَةِ وَالنَّظَرِ فَهَذَا لَمْ يَنْهَى السَّلَفُ عَنْهُ مُطْلَقَى بَلْ إذا كان بالحق فقد تكون المناظرة واجبة تارة ومستحبة أخرى. He says that debate in and within itself is not something that the Salaf and the pious predecessors have actually prohibited. No, it's not. بل راضى ابن تيمية says إذا كان بالحق if that debate and that argument is based upon truth and it's based upon evidences فقد تكون المناظرة واجبة. Sometimes that debate might even be obligatory, let alone it's obligatory, let alone it being haram or prohibited. It can actually even be obligatory. That's what he said. Ta and he goes on to say, Wajibatan Taratan wa mustahabbatan ukhra. And sometimes it can be highly recommended. That a person would be recommended the akhi debate. And he goes on to say, Wasalafu lam you har lam you haramu ma'arifa tadalika. So if that's the case, that debating is something that can be obligatory and not, then what would it mean? It will entail and it would mean that knowing the science of jadal and debating would also be something that you would have to look into and know and understand. If it's something that can actually reach wajib, where you'd have to go and debate, as they say, If it becomes obligatory, then it would mean that you would have to study this science. My beloved brothers and sisters, there are distinct things when you look at the debates of Ahl-Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Khasa'is wal Jidali and Ahl-Sunnah. Ahl-Sunnah have a distinct, unique way of way, the way they debated. Their debates and their dialogues, it had what's called mumayizat, distinct noble characteristics, which you won't find in other groups and other people in their debates. And that's insha'Allah ta'ala what I will be speaking about now. The first khasiyah that they had, the first khasiyah, the first distinct characteristics, this noble characteristics which they held and they stuck by was what? أَنَّهُمْ يَرْغَبُونَ فِي هِدَايَةِ الْخَصْمِ وَيَتَقَرَّبُونَ بِذَلِكَ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّهِ They were trying to get closer to Allah. Their drive, their motive from the whole debate was basically desiring, and they were passionate about bringing this individual back to guidance. So they were, that's what they were getting closer to Allah by. 
Their intent wasn't Dhuhur wa Nusra. Are you with me, brothers? Their, their ultimate goal wasn't to be apparent. And nor was it to bring victory home. That wasn't what they looked for. Well, their goal was to please Allah by being able to guide this individual. So that's the path, of, that's, that's what they were looking for. And to bring this person back to the truth. That was a, that's a distinct characteristic that they hold. Second is أَنَّهُمْ يَحَرِسُونَ عَلَى التَّقْلِيلِ مِنَ الْكَلَامِ مَا اسْتَطَاعُوا أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاعَةِ They didn't like talking a lot. They would speak the least at the minimum. They wouldn't allow their speeches to go for long. They would summarize their points as short and as what? And as precise as possible. So the minimum in which they can get their point across and their intent is understood is what they would take. And that's what they used to strive towards. They didn't like this tatwilul kalam where their speech is unrestrictedly said and it's just you become a lecturer and the other person becomes a lecturer. That wasn't their intent. Their intent was ma qalla wa dalla. That which is little but gets to the point. And of course this is the Prophet sallallahu way in which he used to do in his speech. What did he say? I was given the summarized speech. When we say Jawab al Kalim, what do we mean? Qalilul Mabani, Adimul Mani. The wording is very little, but the meaning is vast and it's great and it's big. So in your debate, you don't leave that prophetic way. But when you speak, you speak the you speak very small and you get your point across. The third one is they don't entertain the idea of takalluf. Takalluf here means overburdening yourself, making yourself come across as what you're not. That's not what they were. You find some people, they have takalluf in their speech when they talk. The words that they like to use, it's big words. They look for the biggest of the words. You see, they like to posture themselves in a way when they're debating. All those is takalluf. If it's not, if it's from your norms to talk like this, then that's not takalluf. Or you stand and that's the way you talk when you, your, body, your body language is like that. Then if it's, this is the way you are, then this is normal. But if you're doing it, takalluf, this is not you. They wouldn't do that. <clears throat> and that's very common in many people. That's, it's very dangerous for you to do that because what you're not really doesn't last for too long. If you pretend to be what you're not, you really don't last for too long. Somalis, they say, a walk that isn't yours, you can't pass three steps. If it's not your type of walking, and this is not how you generally walk, okay? After three steps, you just can't carry on anymore. Maybe three is not the right number, but it just means the idea of carrying on something won't be there. The fourth distinct characteristics, which is that that they are intact. They are, it's found in them. They consistently stick to good etiquette in their debates and their arguments. They try to do that. And they are debating, they observe good manners. They observe the good way of talking. So they come with adab al munadharati wal jadali. The etiquettes of debating and arguing. I mean, sometimes you listen to Sheikh Muhammad Nasruddin al Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala. And the person is talking. And subhanAllah, sometimes you think to yourself, has the ship gone? Has he left the gather or something? So long that this person is talking for, he does not interject. He doesn't interrupt. And he's quiet. He just lets the person finish their point. And then he talks. And he gets his point across. 
And subhanAllah, the hayba that the Shaykh has, rahimahullah ta'ala, and the ability to articulate his point as soon as he gets over it, and how he makes sure that when he finishes his point, he's responded to a person who said so many different things. It's ajib. Muhammad Nasr al-Din al-Albani's debates are profound. Profound. And the way he gets points across. And the way he's able, rahimahullah ta'ala, to make the individual who's talking to him be engaged with his dialogue. He wouldn't speak and let, do a lecture and let, make you listen to that. He wouldn't do that. He will bring you in and he will ask you a question and he will want to answer from you. And then as a point that I'm going to mention later in some of his, um, his methods that he used to use. So we'll speak about that inshallah ta'ala if time gives it to us today. The fifth distinct characteristics which is أنهم يحذرون في المجالات من تلك المصطلحات والألفاظ المشتركة والمجملة. When it comes to debating, they stay away from ambiguous terms. There are some terms that consist in it. تشتمل على معاني حق حقه ومعاني باطلة. Some words they have truth in it, and they also have falsehood in it. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'a, they don't come with words which are ambiguous when they know there's a word which is clear cut and the meaning is by, understood by everybody. Sticking to ambiguous words and using that is not what they do. And the way to do that is to take terms which are set by the Sharia. And if you look at the majority of the debates today, you find that the biggest reason is definition of words. You find the biggest reason why people's debates is not heading towards success is because terms are not being defined. What do you mean by this word? What's your definition based on this word? And who preceded you in this definition? Okay? So this is um, uh, terms like that. Ahlul Bida, they like the idea of using terms which are ambiguous. So whilst he's debating with you, the term has this meaning and this meaning both in it. So he's jumping one time from this meaning and sometimes he's jumping from that meaning. And he just keeps using that one term. You need to strip that from him. And you need to make sure that when you say this term, it has this meaning in it and this, which one of those do you mean? And once he says, I mean that, say, let's not use this word anymore. Let's use this then. So everybody knows what you're, what you're using. Are you there? Number six. The sixth is the distinct characteristic of their debate is that أنهم مستمرين على أنواع الطاعة في سلوكهم وعمالهم. They are consistent upon different types of acts of obedience in their way they carry themselves, in their actions, and etc. In other words, أهل السنة والجماعة are not people who bring everything onto one part of or they don't enter the religion only from one part and make that, no. They actually take the religion wholeheartedly. And what that means by is brothers, you find a group of people who are only debaters, khalas, nothing else. And that's what he's made his religion. He doesn't have to direes and ta'aleem, he doesn't educate and teach the people. He also doesn't, he's not known for his act, other acts of obedience. All he is is just a debater. This is not what Ahlul Sunnah's distinct characteristics are. They have different types of obedience. They use this method. They use this method of teaching as well. They're not just consistent upon debating and arguing. They also educate the people. There are some people who don't want to debate with you. They don't want to argue with you. They're just open-minded. They just want to take on points. Fresh, newborn youngsters, kids, youths. The doubt hasn't come to them yet. They're open-minded. They want to take it from you. If you're dismissing those people and you're waiting for them to turn out to be argumentative individuals and then you can debate them. So all you're going to do is just, does that make sense? You're missing out a generation or a group of people whose mind is open for whatever you want to pour in there. Does that make sense? Because the ones who want to debate with you are some majority of the time are people who have a preconceived notion. They've got something already there. They believe in something. So they're coming to you with a belief that's there. 
So it's not from the path of Ahlul Sunnah to always just focus on those type of people. They also focus on the others and the other people out there. The Salaf who had the Ummah warned against, now we finished that point, inshaAllah ta'ala. The Salaf, they warned about some types of debates. They said, this debate is not, it should be done. And the debates that they warned against are many, and we'll just mention some of them. The first one is, debate on things, al fil masail al adamiyah Debating in matters that the benefit doesn't, there's no benefit in it. Once you both come to a conclusion, what's going to happen after that? Are you with me, brothers? Are you with me, brothers? This debate that me and you are having right now, it's truly from the Masail Adabiyatul Fa'idah. The Fa'idah of us discussing this issue, having a dialogue about it, is really baseless. There's nothing that's going to happen from it. There's no thamara that's going to come from it. There's no fruit that's going to be taken out of it. It's just going to be debated and we walk away. And I feel like nowadays what you find is that a lot of people that entertain this idea of that kind of debate. That everybody wants to make a debate out of something. Some things, the way to deal with it is Turn away, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said. Turn away from those who are ignorant, who don't know. I mean, those ignorant ones here that I've been spoken about, spoken about are the ones who are ignorant, who think they know. The ones who have jahl murakab, a compounded ignorance. Their ignorance is that they believe they know, but they really don't know. Turn away from them. Because what he wants to debate with you is things that if we do get up and we leave, we're not going to bring about any difference on it. And there's no fruits that are going to come out of it. So they warned against those kind of debates. And it does fall under time wasting. Second type is that they warned against is the debate of a person who is not sahih. The person doesn't have Islamic knowledge. He doesn't even he doesn't understand the kitab, nor does he understand the sunnah. He doesn't understand it. So the scholars and the sunnah they warned against that. That person they said that he's not permitted, nor is he allowed to go into debates. Because he has no foundations to go back to when the debate kicks off. The pe debates don't have a script that you're going by. Debates is not about script. Debate goes off topic. People go to other issues. They speak about what you guys were talking about. They go there, they jump from there to there to there. And your knowledge of the, 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 the Sharia has to be very vast. And if the debate goes into language, you have some understanding of the language. That if the debate goes into usul al fiqh, you have some understanding of usul al fiqh. That if the debate goes into aqidah, you have some understanding of aqidah. That if the debate goes into what you call it ilm al mantiq and whatnot, you know, you have some knowledge of that. That you're all rounder basically. Not that I'm saying you have to be an elite and you have to be a master in all of those, which is not necessarily going to be the case. But you have some understanding where you come, you've got foundations of bringing everything back to. And so that's why. That person who doesn't have that foundation would tend to find that he may be good at this particular point. He might know how to debate this particular point. But who assured you that the debate is going to stay that way? Who said to you that the debate will, will not move from that? Are you with me? Especially when the matter is Sharia related, you need to know that the Sharia didn't divide these things like this. Fiqh, Aqeed, Tawheed, Usul, he didn't. This is something that was done later to make the matter easy for the people. The Sharia's doors is open to each and every one of them. They're intermingled. They're all connected. Are you with me? They're all connected. They all stem from what two sources? Kitab and Sunnah. Are you with me, brothers? So you're going to be in a ocean of problems if you don't have ilm shar'i. You don't have the understanding of the Sharia. Your debate is not going to be right. So the scholars, Salafu Hadi Ummah, warned against that type of debater. He should not debate. 